Welcome. Did everybody hear me? Welcome. Um, I'm Bill Lemieux, for those who don't know me, and I'm here to represent the uh, Furl Working Committee, uh, who sponsors, uh, <clears throat> who sponsored this uh, presentation of the land we live on. And uh, we've uh, also uh, sponsored another 11 uh, presentations during the, uh, from February to, to April of the spring. And we have about 450 people registered, uh, which we're very pleased with. Uh, <clears throat> if any of you are interested and have some, some specialty, something you're interested in, uh, that you'd like the rest of the community to know about. Uh, we'd be delighted to help you, <clears throat> help you uh, present your information to the rest of the community. You just have to contact one of us and we'll help you to do the rest. Now, <clears throat> without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Charlie Rotenbau, who's gonna give you the presentation today. And he's a fascinating man. Uh, we had uh, dinner together, lunch together today, and uh, we found that we have a great deal in common, I think. And uh, <clears throat> so without further ado, uh, you're on, Charlie. Okay. Attachments, can you hear me all right? Okay, um, I look out, uh, my wife and I had a friend who was dyslexic uh, in Madison and uh, he, he used to get words, he'd get just so close to a word but it wouldn't end up being the right word. And one of the favorite ones that he used to say was, well, we've got such a congealed crowd. <laughs> and that's what I always think of when, <laughs> look out um, in, to an audience. Um, this is a story that I bring to you today um, about North Carolina and about a particular area of North Carolina. Uh, if, as we go on, you'll be able to zero in on where it is a little bit more as you'll see other maps. But it essentially is, if you can visualize the Virginia border north of us, and this is in Rockingham County, which is the county between Guilford and the Virginia border. And this is about 26,000 acres, which is the northeast corner of Rockingham County, right up against the Virginia line. So. That's what we're talking about, an area up near Milton in Caswell County, and it is east of Reedsville and Eden. Actually, Eden is, is part of this 26,000 acres. So just to get you a little bit oriented to begin with, um, more than 30 years ago, I guess, I bega became very interested in this land. You know, you start talking about it and there are catch words that get your attention right. 26,000 acres, that's a lot of land. Uh, and it goes back to a date of 1738 when we were running the North Carolina-Virginia border. There wasn't a border even then. And this is a time when the two states had delegates on the border commission, and they were literally surveying the border, starting in the waters of the Atlantic and coming east. And they got this far in, and uh, in North Carolina was, of course, the uh, valley of humiliation between two great mountains of conceit, which are Virginia and South Carolina and had very little money. So William Byrd, who was one of the Virginia delegates and was fabulously wealthy for the time, 
uh, knew that the commissioners were going to be paid in land because North Carolina didn't have the funds to pay them. So he made a deal with two of the commissioners to buy their share of what North Carolina was going to give them in land for having done the line. And that is what ended up as this 26,000 acres. That's how he got it. So it starts out with William Byrd, starts out with the dividing line between the two counties. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, and William Byrd, who is, uh, is a program all unto himself, if you've ever run into him in history, he's a fantastic person to, uh, to look at or to study. So we're, uh, this is Byrd. He, I said it was 1738 when he was running the line. He died in 1744, so it was only six years before his death. <clears throat> and you see the magnificence of the man, magnificence of the man. Now, the reason they could pick this 26,000 acres, you're in the middle of nowhere. No land has ever been sold out this far, east, far west. And how do you do it? You go out and you say, well, we'll start with that tree over there or that rock over there. How, how do we begin to make a survey of land in a wilderness? Well, they had just run this, whoop, I knew I'd got to get to which one I'm using here. Okay. This is the dividing line, as you see along here. And here is the Dan River, part of the Roanoke River system. So they began his survey right there where the border hit the first, the Dan River for the first time. And they read it as three miles south. So they had that line, they had the east line, they had the north line. And so they came over here and they ran a line on the other side of the Smith River, which the dividing line was all also taking. And they said, all right, and nine miles south on that. And then they could, they could connect the base. And what his purpose was, was to enclose the Dan River because he knew it went down into North Carolina and then he knew it came up into Virginia and <clears throat> he thought he would get it all in and then he would develop that particular geographic entity, if you will, the land on the Dan in North Carolina on the Virginia border and he could sell it to Virginians and he found he missed it. You see, the, uh, the, the dividing line did not take in the Dan River here. So he had to get 6,000 more acres of his, originally it was 20 and then he added the six. And this is the land we're talking about. Uh, it is still referred to, uh, he gave it the name, the Land of Eden. And in the 1950s, when they merged three towns with Leakesville, Draper, and Spray, which were all were at the convergence here of the, of the river, uh, they had to get a merged name, something everybody could agree to, and they pulled up Eden again. And that's how <clears throat> we have the present uh, town of Eden. So that's the land we're going to be talking about. Now, <clears throat> the arrow here in the middle is on the line and showing approximately where the land of Eden is right here on the north. Here's the Atlantic Ocean. Here's North Carolina. Here's the dividing line between Virginia. And just before you get to the mountains is the land we're talking about. Now, <clears throat> at the same time this was going on, England was developing in the Caribbean uh, not only the slave trade, but the sugar trade. So the islands of the Caribbean were the place where they were growing sugar, 
And then the French got into it and they began growing sugar. And sugar's a very, uh, well, all crops are unique in their own way, but the uniqueness of sugar is that it is highly labor intensive. If you're cutting down sugar stalks, it's like cutting down a basket or a parcel of knives because the stalks are very, uh, they're worse than bamboo. They're very, very tough and they've got these uh, leaves that are like razors. So it was a very difficult thing in the field because they were on islands in the Caribbean. And then the next process in sugar was to boil it. And the boiler rooms for sugar were death traps. Uh, they literally were pots of boiling sugar uh, that you had to stir and people fell into them all the time, which gave a good test, taste to sugar. But <clears throat> here is the island down here on this arrow of Antigua, which is the right on the Leeward or the end of the, Car the Leeward Islands. These islands right here in the Caribbean are the Leeward side if you're sailing leeward side or leeward. Uh, and Antigua is right at the top of the St. John's, St. Kitts, all that area right there are the leeward islands. And so this, this area was being developed in the sugar trade and it was a, a tremendously, uh, tremendously valuable trade to England and then it became an essential trade to France, and then they began fighting over it. So the European wars that were going on between these European powers began to drift to the Caribbean, where they were both had islands, and then began to drift to America, and we have the French and Indian War, which is just another part of all these European wars, the Thirty Years War, et cetera, uh, were all part of this. Now, here is degree of difficulty, planting sugarcane, they had to chop the ground. The land in the Caribbean was very hard. They did not have uh, natural, they, they got their water in cisterns. They did not have wells on the islands, or on Antigua anyway. And they had to capture their water in cisterns. So water was very, uh, very scarce. And <clears throat> this is the windmill tower in which they took the sugar cane and put it in, th whoop, excuse me, in through this opening here where the wind and the power of the windmill crushed it. And then it was taken onto, uh, this is one of the sugar mills still there on Antigua today. And then they took it into the boiler room and this is the place that I'm saying was, was a real death trap and, <clears throat> and processed it uh, into sugar, which was in tremendous demand in Europe at that time. I mean, they, this was a, this was a, uh, a, a really, Demand, in demand, highly in demand product in Europe. Sugar was into everything. This is a typical plantation, if you will, up on the hill. Up, up on the hill here is the plantation and the land around it down to the water here. Here you see the, the mill with the two, two uh, windmills on the side. This is a typical Caribbean uh, mill. All right, uh, what was happening down there at, a, at about the same time was the fact that the Moravian church, and of course in Winston, centered in Winston-Salem, we've got a major center of, of, of Moravian church, and uh, <clears throat> 
they were trying to convert people on these islands. They were great about picking out a place to go ahead and send missionaries. They would direct them in there, and then they would keep written exchanges going on between their colonial work and their missionary work. And they actually wanted to convert people. They weren't proselytizers like the Methodists later were. Uh, and, and didn't, they were very gentlemanly about the way they went in. And of course the, uh, the landowners there, the plantation owners, uh, they wouldn't have anything to do with them. They were all Anglican. And they didn't want anything to do with the Moravians, but they said, we'll let you go to our slaves. And so a few of them allowed the Moravian ministers who were coming in. Now imagine these were Moravian ministers coming from Germany who spoke only German, didn't speak English, didn't speak any of the African dialects of any kind, and they were missionaries to convert people to Christianity. You can see the degree of difficulty they were, they were dealing with, but they were pretty successful among the slaves. And they actually, these are two slides of uh, this one and this one, showing the actual Moravian service in which they baptized and brought in as members of the Moravian church these slaves on Antigua. And they were going through all the process that the various uh, processes of the Moravian church. So they weren't brought in as second class citizens, they were brought in as converted Christian Moravians. Now, they had trouble understanding their pastor and they were Africans at heart, basically, and they were being converted into Christianity here on an island far away from Africa. You can see the mix of what all was going on here. But one of the owners, one of the plantation owners uh, in Antigua, who allowed the Moravians to come on his plantation and preach to his slaves and convert some of his slaves, was a man named Farley, F-A-R-L-E-Y. And Farley's son had gone to school at William and Mary in Virginia and had gotten to know all the Virginia, uh, you know, the, the what FFVs of Virginia. And uh, he had uh, decided that he was going to go there, he was gonna stay there, and his father decided, well, you know, sugar is a product that not as profitable as it has been. Maybe I'll divert some and I'll buy some land on the mainland and he bought this 26,000 acres that Bird had gotten. And so the story goes now to, uh, to the different, the new location, which is going to be in, whoop, which is going to be in North Carolina. And here's another map that is, illustrates what we're talking about. Here's, this is an 188 map, so it's not a current map. But it does show very easily, this is, uh, this is Guilford County. Probably put my thumb over it. This is Guilford County here in 1808. This is Rockingham County. Now, Rockingham and Randolph below here were all once Guilford County. That was all, those three counties made up the original Guilford County. All right, up here in the northeast corner, where you see the Dan River coming into North Carolina out of Virginia, then going back out of into Virginia, coming back in, passing the Smith River, and then staying in North Carolina until over near Stokes County, it goes back up into, into Virginia. Uh, as I say, Bird looked at this and he said, this is, if I can get this tract, this will make it really attractive for settlement. And he went into it big time. He actually got an agent in Switzerland. 
Uh, he wrote a book called Neuschwanstein uh, Eden, which was the new land of Eden. And he advertised this place all throughout Switzerland and Germany for settlement. He actually got a couple of boatloads of Swiss on the way. One of them wrecked. The other one went to the wrong port, went to New York. And uh, <clears throat> so he was all the time trying to develop this as uh, a place where he would bring settlement in. Now comes this man from Antigua. He's diversifying his holdings. He can't do sugar here. Sugar doesn't grow well in this particular region. But tobacco is, the, this is before the era of textiles, so tobacco was the big thing. And what he was going to do was he was going to bring slaves from his Antigua plantation. Now, these are people who are first generation from Africa. They've stopped off in Antigua where they've been made sugar slaves, and now he's taken them to the frontier of America in North Carolina, and he's going to put them down where there is no white settlement at all in the middle of nowhere, and he's going to create a Virginia tobacco plantation. So he had a pretty good dream and a, and a lot of work, a lot of work to do, and that's essentially what we're what we're looking at today. Um, all right, let's see. This is just a quick shot of how they were, at that time, this is a typical, the, uh, these are the buildings that are associated with tobacco raising at that particular time. And of course, typical of Virginia plantations, the slaves were all quartered in slave houses that were near the main, the main plantation. Now, William Byrd had a granddaughter named Elizabeth Hill Byrd. She was quite a beauty in her day. And uh, James Park Farley, the son of the man from Antigua, is going to school at William and Mary. And in the society of Williamsburg, they meet and they court and he marries William Byrd's granddaughter. So it's back in the Byrd family again uh, with all this. But she's the connecting link into these stories from Antigua and to um, North Carolina and the Saratown. They actually come out to the Saratown in 1774 and they start a Virginia plantation house. Now, she's got a sister who's married into the Harrison family in Virginia, and the sister starts to build a plantation in Virginia, and it's known as Brandon, and some of you may have been to Brandon because it still exists, but this is what exists still today. I've got a more up-to-date picture, but this is an, of the remaining part of the house that the bird Farley family started building. This was a wing. The rest of the house had burned. But this is the house that, that she was building. They had built a small house which still stands. It's called a, they refer to it as a pedetaire, a French word meaning a, a little, little location it's called. And uh, <clears throat> this is inside the, uh, the pedetaire built in 1772, so it's the oldest place in Rockingham County. This is Brandon, which was her sister's home, and you see its style is to have this center portion here, and then the two wings, the matching wings on either side. And it had a river front, which is this front, this is facing out on the river, and it had a land front on the other side. And we are convinced through archaeology, et cetera, that essentially this is the same design. This is an earlier picture of it. This is the same design that was being used in Rockingham County. And this is not a good slide to see. But you can actually take 
Brandon and that picture, that previous picture, and put it right down today between that little house that still stands and the two-story wing of the main house. And that's actually the finest plantation in North Carolina because it was a it was a Virginia, Virginia plantation. The Virginians were coming over and building and they were, they were agreeing to invest in North Carolina as long as the river separated them from having to have any dealings with North Carolina. So <clears throat> this is the house today. It's, it still exists. And this, is, this is part of what we're, what we're talking about. We've actually done uh, archaeology work there. And this is the brick house I just showed you. This is the little house over here, and in the middle we see we found foundation uh, for the original house. So all that's all that's still there is an archaeological site. Where are the slave quarters? Excuse me. Where are the slave quarters? Where are the grave? Slave quarters. Slave slave quarters. Quarters for the slaves. Oh, okay. Uh, the. Slave quarters were down south of this. Uh, there's actually a road that goes down, be whoop, goes down behind the house here, and it was the, uh, yeah, come on here. Here we are. Anyway, it was over here in this area, right here, and farm road that went down and then cross the Dan River, because this is on the Dan, on the Dan River. We don't see the pointer. Yeah. They were over here. That's, that's part we haven't gotten into yet. Now, as I get into the story a little bit further, you'll, you'll recognize that people at UNC, the archaeology department and all that, are very interested in the slave quarters. That hasn't been explored yet, really. All right, we're going back now to the discovery portion. We talked about the slaves in Antigua, what their life was there. Now, <clears throat> they were brought to this country. This is the typical <clears throat> way they were brought into the woods. It's always fascinated me, and one of the unanswered questions we've got is, how did uh, James Park Farley think that he could take slaves from Antigua, who had been very free in Africa, and had been brought over to be in a sugar plantation on an island where they couldn't get off anyway, so they were, they were hemmed in. But they brought them over to the mainland and stuck them down in the middle of a forest. Well, why didn't they walk off? Why didn't they just up and leave? And they didn't. Part of what we've been able to figure out, uh, kind of put together over the years, is this faith that the Moravians had brought them. Uh, they had turned them into a community. They were no more a, a group of slaves brought from various places in Africa and put down in a sugar plantation they were now by themselves on an island in uh, the middle of uh, America. What was the southwest or southeast was the middle of America at that time. So this is how they were brought in on what they call COFLs, C-O-F-F-E-L-S, and that's this contraption they've got around their necks so that they could bring them in and they could get them into the forest. But our question now is how did they keep them in the forest once they, once they got there? Well, uh, let me say this about, about the slave part of it. Um, when I was in college, which was a lot of years ago at Carolina, uh, and I was studying history, I ran across one day in the library the Morav in the Moravian archives, I ran across a record in 1755 that said a man named Farley had come to visit Old Salem, plantation owner from down on the Dan, 
and he had recently brought a hundred Negroes from Antigua to his plantation. That's the first time I had seen a specific reference to this group. And the minute I saw it, I said, there's a real story here, you know, Antigua, slaves, North Carolina, how did they get here? How did they stay here? All these things came up. And as I say, I've been working on it for 30 years. There was that much of a story to keep uh, mining, if you will. The biggest discovery that we made over the years was uh, in 2012 at the archives in Richmond, Virginia, Virginia Archives, we came across a case in 1809 that was Dinwiddie, Crawford and Company against Farley, et cetera. And I realized this was a case that was being brought by a Scottish merchant in Scotland, in Glasgow, against a Virginia uh, owner, a plantation owner who was dead about land in North Carolina where there were 100 Negroes still living. And it took me a long time, actually it took me two visits to the archives to go up to Virginia to the archives. I knew that there was this case somewhere. It, the reference was always to the archives in Virginia. And I kept telling them, you know, here's the case, here's the date and everything. I want to see this. Well, it's not here. We don't have it. We don't have it. Finally, on the second visit, they pulled out this box, which was, uh, you know, looked like a box for a suit, about that high. And it was filled with papers from 1809. Now, the significance of that is the fact Revolutionary War is over. The Scots are still owed money from the Americans from that dead gum war. And a Scot's not going to give up on a debt if he possibly can. So here in about the second or third generation of this Scots, Dinwiddie, Crawford and Company, they're still suing Americans for what they left as bills when they revolted back in 1776. So this is some uh, 35 to 40 years later. They're still pursuing this debt. Now, in order to pursue the debt in 189, they've got to get all the data for what happened back in 1776. So they had done all the work of collecting all this archival material for the case, and it was a federal case, so it was in the federal records. Well, the sad thing is that the federal records for this particular court are housed at the Richmond Virginia archives, but Richmond, Virginia doesn't own them. The, North, or, uh, the federal government still owns them. So near, Virginia archives could care less what happens to them. That's why they couldn't find them. They'd stuck them over in a corner somewhere and essentially forgotten about it. So here I found this, it was literally like mining for gold. I'd found this box full of material that went back to 1808 for what went on in 1776. And if you've ever done any research, finding that kind of discovery still existing in a box that nobody knows about is like discovering gold. And it, it, it was for us uh, when we found it. When we opened it up, among the things that were in it, was a 1774 list that I'll show you in a minute of the original 100 slaves that I had read about out back in college that he had brought from Antigua by name, some of them still with their African names. So again, you could just see each one of these things was just a, a big discovery of something you never thought still existed anywhere. And <clears throat> this then became the base of furthering, all right, here's, here's the list. A list of Negroes on the land of Eden, 1774. 
And here they all are by name. And you'll notice as you go down here, Polydor. Uh, let's see some of, the, some of the names on their two lists here. And uh, there's some African names. And this is the other half of the list. They left half of them in Virginia on the way to, to back up what they brought to North Carolina, but they eventually brought them all down uh, to, to North Carolina. See some great names in there, including Marlboro is always one of my favorites in there. Uh, but here was the discovery of this actual list. And these were the slaves that we were we had run into, or I had run into back in college. Now, additionally in the box, where every five years they took an inventory of the slaves again. So from 1774 until they actually sold the Sorry Town, which was in 1801, for a period of 25 to 30 years, we're able on these lists to find the slaves where they are, what's happening to them. Here's a reference to them in the Virginia Gazette where they're being sold. These are all in the same box in, in Richmond uh, until the time when they actually sell the uh, plantation and they have these slaves left over. These are the ones who are still there and they have to divide them among the four daughters of James Park Farley. So each one gets some cows and some pigs and some slaves as part of, the, part of their personal property. Um, let's see. So what we were able to do with this, or what I was, I was able to construct, was I was able to construct skeletal biographies of 100 slaves at the end of the Revolutionary War, who lived up there in the frontier land of North Carolina. Uh, imagine what a hundred people, how many African Americans, particularly in our area, have descendants out of those slaves. Uh, how much they would have affected the popular African American population in our area. And that got me into working with African Americans on genealogy. And they have a real difficult situation in genealogy. The African Americans ordinarily can go back to emancipation and they're dead end. Because Sally is Sally if she's four different people. But who which Sally is she? You know, they they just there to stay and still. Well, here, if we can work our way back from emancipation to this, we can connect these people up with their ancestry today, and that's the ultimate of what we hope will be done. Uh, at my age, at, uh, next month will be 90, uh, I realize that destiny for me is probably not to get that far with the story. So I'm working really hard to find a nice, young African American uh, who will take this project over and carry it on from here. But it's such a rich project that I don't want to, I don't want to leave it just wide open. This is the kind of biographies we've been able to, to develop, and I'm not going to read all this to you, but see, this is Addie. And I've been able to say where she was at the different places right up to 1807. I've been able to figure out what she did, that she was a house servant and what she was likely to have been doing. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and with archeology, span anthropology, working those slave cabins, which we haven't been into yet, there's a huge slave graveyard marked only with field stones, so there's no names on those. But through, again, archaeology and anthropology, we'll get all sorts of clues in there to who they were, what they did, how they ate, et cetera. Those are all kinds of things. The area of African-American studies is fascinating. 
And I work today with a woman uh, in, at Howard University who is head of the Cobb Research Institute at Howard University. And uh, she is a, a doctor who is doing studies on uh, the nature of, of body, uh, of food and nutrition and all that kind of thing, because those are, we talk about those as general factors, but they're also connecting links. If you can find a nutrition link, you can probably find, get back to Africa and pick up where it came from, where those foods were. So all these things are like finding little nuggets of information, putting them on a timeline and working them out so they're, they are really able to tell you a story. Now, we've put these in books at the museum in Rockingham County. They're on a table, it's made like this, but it's a round table and they're different notebooks. And African Americans can come in and look at these biographies. Now, <clears throat> you, you wouldn't believe it until you see it, and then you realize, well, of course it happened. But we've had people going through there, African Americans, who get into those books, and they're looking for Elizabeth, or they're looking for John, well, there's an Elizabeth and a John in every plantation in North and South Carolina. So, but when they find Elizabeth or John in this, that's my ancestor. You can see them make a connection that we Westerners, white folks, take for granted when we do genealogy. We get, we link back and keep linking back. And, they can't do that. When they get to the point of emancipation, they're cut off from that. And to be able to give them the hope that someday in the future, this link will be filled with enough information that they can make the connection is like giving a whole people a new area of hope that they, that they didn't have. So it's extremely rewarding to do, I, let me say. Let me put it that way. <clears throat> we, here's Abraham. Abraham is one who was exposed to the Moravians. And this write-up about Abraham is actually in the Moravian archives because the Moravians require biographies of everybody who dies and they keep a record. So this is, this is Abraham's record. Daniel Fielder, we found, has a connection. With, the, with Thomas Jefferson and Monticello. Just when you get these little connections, it's amazing. Uh, you know, here's a name, all of a sudden you're looking on the page and here's Thomas Jefferson. Well, you, that actually obviously piques your interest and you follow it and you begin to get this whole story of this man who was a freed black in, in Charlottesville, Virginia. So. These have all been things that we've gotten to the point where we are looking now at African Americans in the sense that we should all be looking at them. I am a human being. I have a story. I have roots just like you do. If you will recognize the things that where we are alike and what we share as human beings, and if you'll concentrate on that, and I don't mean white people have to concentrate on it about African Americans, but African Americans have to concentrate on it the other way, then the potential for better understanding is right there. It's, it exists right there. Uh, we can study things like where, this is a quick chart of where they came from in Africa that by by season, so we know if we could date a body or something like that, chances are we can make some conclusions of where they might be from. We have st all sorts of studies about physiognomy that uh, we could go to, and we've got our, we've got our Moravians. Uh, the Moravian story is now going into a book uh, that the Moravians went at from the standpoint, they called it uh, 
becoming American. And what they realized was that the Moravian church at the end of the Revolutionary War had to decide what they were going to be. Were they going to be a religious sect with a wall around their town, or were they going to be Americans? And they didn't just suddenly vote to be Americans. It was an evolutionary change that they had to make over time. But the study of becoming Americans is becoming is, is studying those various steps that they took. One of the steps is this connection with slaves, with African Americans. Because the Moravians had an awful time from a moral standpoint dealing with slavery. Uh, it was, biblically, they could find that it was not something they should be doing. They, however, were very insular in their thinking and they didn't want they didn't want Irishmen in there, much less a black in Old Salem. So they had to go through all that process of, of dealing with slavery, and that was part of their becoming Americans. And it's, we did a lecture series uh, last year with Wake Forest and um, National Trust uh, on on this subject, and it's now been put into a into a book. Uh, burials. This is a typical slave burial. Slaves were buried at night. Why? Because they were in the field all day long. They had to bury them at night. It, wouldn't, it wasn't they were spooky or wanted to get uh, some sort of, uh, you know, a tradition for, that they brought over from Africa. They had to bury them at night. Now, this is in Africa. This is a typical graveyard with this kind of marker. This is an American graveyard. Do you notice the same, sameness of the format of these things? This is the work of Thomas Day, the free black car carpenter from Milton, who brought those African traditions from the graveyard to the plantation home in Caswell County. These are the threads we're, we're working with. We br brought, this is a group of uh, professors from UNC who are here. We've got two anthropologists and then uh, my friend in the middle. And we, next to the graveyard in, in Eden to give you a physical example of, is this an old place? Look at this roadbed. A lot of travel over that roadbed to wear that thing down to that level. Uh, that's a colonial roadbed that's right on the left is the, is the African cemetery. <clears throat> now, let me close with just a little bit more general and more modern situation. Uh, these figures are, are debatable at the bottom here because there's always a debate going on, how old is man, where did man start, et cetera. But <clears throat> most academics today uh, agree that uh, they came out of Africa and that in a period between 200,000 to 150,000 years ago, uh, they originated in Africa and then in 70,000 to 60,000, years ago, they began to move out. And these are essentially the, the routes that humans took to populate the world. Uh, for our area, the humans were all coming from this part of the Horn of Africa, the Bight of Benin. This is, you know, Africa curves out here into the Atlantic curves out here into the Atlantic, and this is really on the bottom of the Horn of Africa. This is where they're coming from, and this is where their traditions start out. Now, we can get even more specific to the studies. Things like <clears throat> here, the role of environment, ancestral genetics, and population structures in health disparities. This is, this is where universities like Howard are and the Cobb Institute are, are taking this thing even, even further in what they're looking at. Uh, 
Hypertension is a major risk, risk factor for stroke, my, myocardial infraction, heart attacks, health, heart failures, et cetera, et cetera. Hypertension is a major contributor to global disease burdens with the wide prevalence of 26% of the world suffers from hypertension. Uh, a million people estimated. Currently in the United States, 73 million Americans have hypertension, but the prevalence is among African Americans. Now we know that from experience, it's in the papers all the time of African Americans who die of early of heart problems, one sort or another. <clears throat> now, if you look at the ethnic distribution of people around the country, you see of course, whoops, you see a course down here. Brian, it's not cooperating with me today. But anyway, you see the purple part down here where North Carolina, where the South is. That's, that's the distribution or the concentration of African Americans to be studied. Now, there are three particular areas that have been closely studied in these. Uh, among these ethnic groups, and one of them is the Carolina coastal area, and actually we're in that. But there are the three areas in the Chesapeake and in the Mississippi Delta. Now, <clears throat> we can go back into Africa at where these people are coming, and you'll see that, well, I don't, I got another one in here. I don't know whether it'll work better or not. Uh, you'll see that coming out of Africa, we know what uh, areas they're coming from, and we know what areas in America they're going to. Now, in Africa, we talk about it as a salt-deprived area of the world. Salt was very scarce in Africa. The country or the tribe that had salt had money, and the concentrations of the development of societies in Africa are in those places where they, where they had salt. So it was very coveted. They loved salt. African Americans tend to love salt. And they're brought to this country and put down right next to a McDonald's. And uh, what happens? They have too much salt and they have hypertension. And it all is a chain of things that we understand better today that doctors actually are able to study today because they're looking at these different changes. And here you see it from the central part of Africa where most of our uh, slaves came from to the uh, southern coast of America, you're bringing them from salt deprivation to salt saturation and you're having a medical result that you're seeing today in the actual population of the time. Uh, so anyway, this work is still going on. Uh, the Sartown Project is now physically located at the Cobb Research Institute at Howard University. Dr. Fatima Jackson, who I loved working with because she is not only African American, she's also Muslim. And I had no connection with either one of them particularly until I really got to work with her. And she has spread my vision of the world very much wider. And this story of the Sara town by following it over 30 years has done the same thing. You can see how research and putting these things into a timeline of activity and knowing what's going on in the rest of the world concurrent with that timeline begins to tell you all kinds of stories. And um, that's what Bill and Jim and I, today at lunch, we, one story after another we were connecting. And that's, that's part of what this kind of research does. And Furl is really 
part of that same kind of thing. It's an extension into uh, assisted living or into retirement community that is perfect for it, but it also has capacity to relate to the to education everywhere. And uh, it's such a fascinating program that, that uh, you have here. You're so lucky to have people who can lead you into it. And it was just really great when I'm working on a parallel course and find Jim and Furl working on a similar course and how there is this connection uh, between the two of them. And uh, I hope I gave a few minutes for any questions that you might have. Do I have what? Uh, yeah, I've written uh, several books about it. I've got a, one of the books over here, if any of you are, are interested, which tells about Sartown and, and all about that. Yeah. Yes. What is the name of the museum where the biographies are? It's, well, they call it MARC, M-A-R-C, Museum and Archives of Rockingham County, and it's in Wentworth. It's the old courthouse in the central of Win uh, part of Wentworth. That we, of course, there's only one part of Wentworth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the name Sourtown, I know there are Sourtown Mountains. Right. But in this instance, is that the same as Eden? This is the same as Eden. Same as Eden. Well, the Sara Indians were all along the Dan River. I mean, if it wasn't Virginia and North Carolina, they were just in that area. So you get Upper Sarratown, which is up in Stokes County in the Sarratown Mountains. You get Lower Sarratown, which is part of the 26,000 acres. So it's all along the Dan River. That's the connection. It's the same Indians, same Indian tribe. They just, they knew no boundaries when they weren't having a good crop year. They just moved over somewhere. And up and down the river was the way they, they settled. Any others? Well, thanks for your attention. I know this is a, a very specific thing, and maybe you haven't brought a lot of uh, roots connection to it, but I think in, in and of itself, it's, it's interesting how modern technology and areas like history and archaeology and so forth are giving you so many more tools to ask so many more questions to find so many more things in libraries in Richmond, Virginia that somebody's had in a box for 150 years and hadn't looked at. You know, that's where you get the... Have you used DNA at all to uh, trace... We haven't yet, but the, the group you saw that I said was from UNC, they were here on a preliminary... That was the cemetery they were in. And we had anthropologists and all, and the idea was to do uh, digs in the cemetery. Now, there are a lot of legal things you got to go through for you dig in a cemetery. But uh, anyway, that's, that's being done. Plus the fact that Dr. Fatima Jackson at Howard is head of the Cobb Institute, was responsible for the Negro or the slave graveyard in New York City. I'm sure many of you read about that over the years in building one of the high rises down on the battery, they found they were in a slave graveyard. And they, before they built anything on it, they, anthropologists came in, archeologists, and they took all the bodies, they've got all the bones, they've got all the connections and all the records, and they're all ha housed at Howard at the Cobb Institute, and that's where they're still studying DNA, et cetera, and what it can tell them there. And we're going to hope that young African-American is going to take this over for me. I hope is going to be working on exactly that kind of thing. Yes, Tom. Charlie, I'm just thankful that 
Sally Gant introduced me to you, and you hooked me into working on the Lindsay Project, which is why you're here today. And uh, it's uh, interesting how we us crazy people connect. And, uh, <laughs> and I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. <clears throat>